to be honest, I didn't know which is the prompt way of greeting based on the time zone difference. So good morning to Washington and good afternoon to Greece and all over all others being among the audience living on the eastern side of the Atlantic. At first, I would like to point out the potential broader impression, but also the aftertaste this fellowship has afforded me, mostly at the personal level before uh, and before I focus on my research, I would like to indicate the harmonious collaboration I have had with the Center at NAFPLIO and with corresponding associates in Washington. Our exchanges were permitted by a spirit of courtesy, promptness, and professionalism for the entire duration of this fellowship. The fellowship has been a spur to the relaunch of my research endeavors within the thematic field I'm particularly interested in, namely reception of ancient Greek drama. It was provided me with a setting of safety, trust, optimism, and confidence in order to take my doctoral research a step further, but also schedule my next moves vis-a-vis -vis the study of this particular meeting. I was especially honored to have been selected as fellow and taking this opportunity, I would like to thank personally, if I'm doing this behind the screen, the selection committee as they, well as my advisors to this project, Mr. Rengakos and Ms. Athanasaki. My interest in future research programs offered by the center remains unwavering. It is immensely gratified to be able to carry on research and achieve personal development within a supportive, constructive environment characterized by high repute and trust. My presentation built on a more narratological base and in a meta-modern environment, so I'm going to ask you to move on 29 centuries uh, on. So we start. Uh, in the context of my one-year one fellowship, I have completed the article titled Phaedra and Hippolytus, the intertextual journey of the mythium in 21st century drama plays. Uh, the article proposed an intertextual approach to the timeless myth of Phaedra and Hippolytus, by looking at its various adaptations, particularly in the Greek dramaturgy of the 21st century. In particular, the paper focuses on the remodeling of dramatic characters and their reconsidered dramatic be behavior in selected Greek plays of this century. These plays are Hippolytos Kalyptomenos by Vasilis Papagiorgi of 2005, Phaedra or Alkistis Love Stories, by Elena Penga of 2007 and Don't Call Me For Phone by Vasilis Alexakis of 2008. Focusing on the intertextual environment in where the mythim matures over time, we can notice that each version of the mythim builds on particularity, either obvious or suggested, delicate or repulsive. The person that is most visibly remote from the Hisebribidian Senecan and Raginian depiction is Hippolytus, the pure young man in Stephaniforos and the man in love in Racine's Fedr is reduced to Sarah Kane's cynical and apathetic hero. Both Phaedra and Theseus remain loyal, mutatis mutandis, to the mythological components with the stepmother confessing her love to Hippolytus and enraged by his rebuke, falsely accusing him to her lawful husband. At the same time, Theseus, ignorant due to his absence, is called upon to assume the role of the tragic father by punishing his son. The addition of tutors and nurses to the main characters is either intended to represent the popular opinion or to add the character's action. They eventually vanish in the contemporary variations where the now liberated heroes act of their own accord and accept the consequences of their actions. Each version contains something unique and at the same time, something vague, something ambivalent and closely bound to human idiosyncrasy, which runs an off-center course around catastrophe or survival. This is precisely the element which provides the mythic episode with adjustability and may be discerned in 21st century plays. The study of the specific modern versions opens a fascinating path that demonstrates how the, their uh, respective writers have 
subversively intervened with the stereotypical structure of the mythin, proposing seemingly new treatments. However, every single one of them contains a thread that links back to the earlier tradition. Also demonstrated here is how the literary material that the Greek writers have borrowed becomes remodeled in order to propose an alternative reception of the meeting. In 2005, Vasilis Papagiorgiou writes in Politos Kalyptomenos, the play reinscribes the mythic episode, drawing on the fragments from the Ribidian lost tra tra tragedy, based on the hypothesis of the hypothesis of the Stephaniforos, as well as the view of Aristophanes in Frogs, line 1043, Euripides appears to have written a second Hippolytus in the aftermatch of the public reaction against the depiction of a shameless feather. Papa Georgiou's play opens on the premise that the relationship between Phaedra and Hippolytus is consummate, and what remains is to explore how the rest of the traumatis persona deal with this fact. The point that differentiates Papa Georgiou heroine from her predecessors is the certainty that Theseus will forgive both her and Hippolytus. Theseus is shown, Theseus is shown to be a metatextually improved character bound to show sympathy. The role of the stern judge is assigned to the polis, the town of Thessaloniki. This is a unique point in the study versions which marries our attention as Phaedra is under the impression that the entire city participates and emphasizes in support of her passion for Hippolytus in spite of the fact that she has committed adultery as though in an effort to instruct the police on the universality and permeability of erotic love. At the same time, she declares that Theseus will show magnanimity, her words indicating she is here as a metatextual judge to cast a critical eye on the stereotypical stages of the episode unfolding. It is as though she seeks to have the denouement of her own drama, her own reinscription of the episode, withdrawn from the traditional denouement, declaring that from now on the characters may act of uh, their own volition and face the consequences of their actions. Talking to Aphrodite in the 10th scene of the play, Phaedra is adamant that what she has chosen and what she feels is not some guts and manipulated desire, but love. What, the implicit, what she implicitly does is to inform the goddess that her play will not be a contemporary traumatization of the rivalry between the two goddesses that foregrounds human weakness and lack of willpower. She clarifies that the traumatic persona in the Calyptomenos, herself included, have evolved to become improved metatextual characters who make choices and assume responsibility for their actions. Nevertheless, Papa Yoryu opts to correct the play, ascribing well-balanced features to the two protagonists, clearly indicative of moral improvement as they have detached themselves from dependency and face their fate, or at least what their mythological role has intertextually allotted them. The last point I would like to focus on regarding Papa Yoryu's version is the role that is the, is the role and the reaction of Theseus in the play's 15th scene when he meets his son Hippolytus. The latter has decided to die while Theseus implores him not to. Papa Yoryu sketches out a tragically weak Theseus who readily forgives Hippolytus and begs him to refrain from further action. He would rather that time stopped and the dramatic heroes lingered in intertextuality with a neutrally, within a neutrally charged zone. In 2007, Elena Benga puts on stage the play Fedra or Alkis, these love stories, where they introduce, where she introduced new characters diverging from the episode's typical structure. 
Benga had wanted to inter interweave two stories similar at points, but at the same time different in order to cast a different point of view on Fendra's line of action. Benga chooses to gradually follow part of the mythic episode, removing, however, the end and the tragic ending, adding instead her own hybrid of two similar stories. In this version, I believe that two similar scenes yield further points of discussion and convergence. In the play's third scene, in the context of a role play, the med servant plays Fedra while Fedra plays Theseus after having put on his clothes. Therefore, the characters change parts in order to set up a remodel scene where the two spouses meet. Penga deliberately chooses to remove Theseus from the dramatis personae and, push him, and puts him on stage only through the use of his clothes in a bit to erase him intertextual uh, role and utility. Consequently, the on-stage confession of Fedra's passion to Theseus only takes place within the control distorted scene that Benga has chosen. Fedra enacts Theseus who express himself through her views based on which Theseus is bound to ask forgiveness for his absence. Benga's Fedra has directed a scene of her own with, circumstance, with circumstances, circumstances and dialogues to her liking in order to justify her passion. In the context of this fictitious meeting, she can now express herself, read of any demureness or regret over everything she has contemplated and did. The sixth scene parallels the third one. It is again a role play where Alcistis is disguised as Admitos and the med servant as Alcistis. The dialogue exposes the decision of a passive and tolerant Alcistis to sacrifice herself in order for Admitos to live. Benga appears to connect the two stories, Phaedra and Hippolytus and Alcistis and Admitos, in as much as Phaedra too willingly chooses to die in order to join Hippolytus in the afterlife. An intertextual carrier of the mythic's typical stages, Benga's Fedra know that Hippolytus will die and opts to follow him. This does not distinguish her from Alcistis. In fact, they seem to have things in common. This particular similarity, Benga identifies and conveys to her readers. In terms of the two mirror scenes, during which the heroines talk with their met servants, it should be pointed out that their respective roles grant them the opportunity to view themselves from a different perspective that of, had, that of their husbands. These scenes all also expose the impact of the male point of view on the heroines and its enactment by them. Also exposed Exposed this is the mechanism that the heroines maintain the manage on their own regarding their self-identification and how they wish to be construed. As a result, we receive Fedra and Alkistis with the same compassion as they both die for love. Within the same play, Fedra and Alkistis are successfully projected as the two faces of a, the assembler a subject which only within the shared setting of death will become reassembled. We conclude this study of the meeting of the meeting's different versions in Greek dramaturgy with Vasilis Alexakis Don't Call Me Fofo. The set is a tiny island which the entire drama unfolds. Alexakis opts to situate Fedra and Inoni alone on an island as a kind of punishment for their actions. Part of their punishment is clearly this agonizing expectation and inertia. For Alexakis, the island is a space of isolation, monasticism, ascetic life, but also a place of punishment. By transporting the two, the two to a remote island, 
away from the shore and the real world, he believes he has finally dislodged them from the intertext. At the same time, he cuts them off and removes them from the episode's typical development. Alexakis intervenes into the intertext and into the episode's revisitations, deeming that this imaginary island is the only safe area where the two women can be held. So what does it symbolize the island? It seems to be a symbol of the meeting itself, which, so to speak, carries the place characters on its back, intertextually, allegorically, and metaphorically, and they are either remodeled, changed, improved, or more or less detached. Alexakis succeeds in creating a persona who is at the same time inside and outside his play and in a position to judge her own behavior as Fedra's intertextual career. She understands why she's on the island, why she's no longer attractive, why she's being punished, why she has been wrong. All in all, she's fully aware of the situation akin to a vision that travels through space and time. The three versions of the Hippolytus Fedra story break out a number of particularities in terms of both structure and character selection. For instance, Theseus incorporated in Papagiorgius Calyptomenos, albeit extensively altered, is omitted from the versions of Penga and Alexagis. Further, this place introduced a second dimension where specific dramatic characters appear to act on the station temporal plane at a distance from their intertextual role by their own volition and on occasion ambiguously. It seems that as we draw away from the archetypal form of the mythim in the time, the place central characters come face to face with their reflection, that dissected figure that has survived and has been intertextually recast. It is precisely with this reflection that they compete both dramatically and, cynica and cynically in order to prevail and prove that the episode's central characters can function of their own free will, live their passion and assume responsibility for their actions. The characters act within a contemporary and modern setting where the present, the present converses with the past to set up an alluring framework for the reception of the meeting. If I made two last points in and out of my presentation, the first point emerged from Papa Georgiou's plays. In the 16th scene, Fedra and Theseus coming together with enigmatic and vague talk Fedra bids Theseus farewell without the least conflict erupting between them. She then leaves, reading into the darkness in order to end her own life. Theseus is left alone on stage. His words transpose him to a place extra human where he retreats into an delusion of drawing into the depths of the sea as seems from the episodes the inhuman flash before his eyes. The second point emerged from Alexakis' play. In the beginning, the author depicts Fedra as a senile persona that dolls up so as to be attractive even to the sea monster that she's certain will fall in love with her. But the Fedra of Alexakis has a different arterial aim to rule over a kingdom in which, purified, she will freely enjoy her love. The reflection with which I would like to close today's presentation is this. Baba Yorion drones Hippolytus in an aquatic world of illusions with the result that in later versions, he does not exist as a dramatic person. The highlight is that Alex Alexakis Fedra intends to rule this aquatic kingdom. After all, is this aquatic world the intertext that follows without Theseus, but with Theseus without 
uh, with but with her intertextual dominance who knows at last i would like to dedicate this presentation to vasilis alexakis the author of don't call me for four who passed away three months ago last january at the age, at the age of 77 as he used to say words are my life i float in a sea of words and i'm doing the question three one month three months later maybe that sea of words is the aquatic kingdom of his federal thank you for your attention <laughs>